Have you ever wished that you could sit down with God and just ask him one question? If you could ask God one question, what would you ask him? What would you ask him? Anybody? Why does he love us so? That's a good question. Because a lot of times we can't, we can't love ourselves. And growing up, nobody loved us or they, they, told, they, they treated us just the opposite. So, so for some people, it's a little difficult. Oh, excuse me. A little difficult when they come into the kingdom to, uh, to accept the love of God. So, so great, Tila. Why, why, why? God, why do you love me? Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I don't know why God loves you. Either. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you, had, if, you, if you could ask God one question, what would you ask him? Why is he always there for us when we do bad? That's good. That's good. Anybody else? There you go. How many have ever asked that question? Why do children have to suffer? Why? Have you ever asked the question, God, why is it that good people have bad things happen to them. You ever ask, well, we're going we're to answer that question. We're going to answer some other questions. And, and I, think, I think we've all asked God those kinds of questions every now and then. When we lose a loved one, God, why did he have to die? I remember that was the first question I ever asked God. First question I ever asked God, I was 12 years old. My, my, my brother, who was about 8 to 10 years older than I was, uh, I was 12, he was 22, he was 10 years older than I was, died in this, in this terrible car accident. And I remember going downstairs as a 12-year-old boy, crying my eyeballs out. As I cried my eyeballs out, I remember just punching the bed and just crying hysterically and saying, God, why? Why? Why him? Why not me? Are you with me? And I think we've all had those kinds of experiences. Maybe not to that particular, um, what's what I'm looking for, that particular degree. degree, thank you. But yeah, we've all had those kinds of experiences. Who could say amen? amen? Well, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to provide you hopefully with some real answers about the central questions that people ask God. And hopefully these answers will be simple. Hopefully you'll be, able to, you'll be able to catch them. They're going to be straightforward based on facts. Some say based on facts and based on logic. And so I think this series is going to be helpful. I think it's going to help us. It's going to stretch us. It's going to help us build some, some spiritual muscle. And so this morning, uh, if you've got your notes, I want you to take them out. And we're going to be talking about, is God real? Some say, is God real? Now, that was the second question I asked God, because when I prayed, the very first prayer I ever prayed was this, God, if you're real, you ever done that? God, if you're real, get me out of jail. Come on, all you who who've had jailhouse religion. God, if you're real, save my marriage. God, if you're real, heal my baby. God, if you're real. I remember praying. I was, I, was, I was out with my buddies. We were smoking dope, drinking. You know the story. I've told it to you several times. And I went behind the car and I knelt down and I said, God, if you're real and if you can change my life, then change it. So because I don't want to die and go to hell and I don't want to see my friends die and go to hell. And God, if you can change my life, change it. That was over 30 years ago. And Jesus has changed my life. Amen? Yes. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to take them and open them to Psalm, 9, Psalm 19. And we're just going to take a look at one verse. Now, I know in your, in your notes it has Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. The Bible says he has made everything beautiful in his time. And if you never memorized that, if you've never got that in your heart, get that in your heart, take that, write it down, put that on your refrigerator. God makes everything beautiful in his time. Right now... Your life might be a mess, but if you give God some time, turn to your neighbor, tell him, neighbor, give God some time. See, the Bible says that he makes everything beautiful in his time, and he's also set eternity in the human heart. He set eternity in the human heart. What does that mean? That means that every one of us know intuitively that God is real, whether we want to believe it or not. Even atheists, I believe, know deep down inside their heart of hearts. 
I talked with a young man probably three or four months ago. He was in one of our services. His mother came up afterwards. She said, can you talk to my son? I said, sure. And we sat there and we talked, I don't know, for how long. And, and he told me that he didn't believe in God. Told me he didn't believe in the Bible and, and gave me some, some reasons why. I, I shared with him some, some things. And I knew we, we weren't going to convince one another of our positions. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you high school students, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you college students. You get in these classrooms, and there are these people who say, well, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in God because of this, 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 and this. But listen, you put every one of those people on an airplane, and you tell them that, air, that airplane's going down, and I guarantee you half of them believe in God. Amen. Hello. Yeah. I mean, it's easy for us to say we don't believe in God until it comes, it comes time to step off. And stand before him. Then in our heart of hearts, most of us know that God is real. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so he said, he has said eternity in the human heart. Psalm 14 verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And this morning, I really want to turn your attention. In our, in our, in our text today is Psalm 19. If you're there, say I'm there. Amen. If you're ready, say let's go. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Let me say that, this again. Look, we're talking about the heavens. Someone say the heavens. We're talking about the skies. David, David and we all know who David is, right? David, at this point, is the king of Israel. He lived about 1,000 B.C. Now, although he lived a long time ago, he was probably one of the smartest men who ever lived. And in fact, from his gene pool came a guy by the name of Solomon who was the wisest man who ever lived. So David wasn't a dummy. Amen? And so David's writing this, this man who was a, who was a victorious general, a king who led his country to the zenith of its economic prosperity. He moved his country from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. He was an innovator, a man's man. And he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. So he's talking about the heavens. And the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now, day after day they pour forth speech. Who's talking to you? The heavens. The skies. I think the skies talked to us yesterday. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. Today, we're going to talk about, is God real? And there are five things that I want to propose to you, five indicators. What is, what is David saying here? David's saying, hey, look. The heavens are speaking to you. The sky is talking. And day after day, creation is saying, look, there's somebody who's bigger than you are. Amen. There's somebody who created all of this. Yeah. And for us to look at that and say, no, I really don't think so, I think... I think we just kind of showed up one day, really is ignorance at its best and stupidity at its worst. Are you with me? And so today we're going to look at five things, five keys that show us that God is real. Are you with me today? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word and we just pray for the next few moments that you'd help me, Lord, to bring forth a word. Help me to bring forth your word in a way that everybody would be able to understand it. Father God, from the most intellectual of us, Lord God, may this not be fodder, may this not be boring, may this not be dry. And Father God, to those of us who are the simplest of us, may it not go over anybody's head. But Father God, may it make sense so that when we sit down with our friends, our family, our relatives, and those, Lord God, who look at us and proclaim not to believe in you, that Father God, we would be able to, without the shadow of a doubt, unequivocally be able to look at them in the eyes and say, I know there's a God. 
I know there's a God because of this, 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 and this. And you can be a fool if you want to, but one of these days you'll stand before him. Father, I pray that you would give us a boldness. Father, for too long we've been timid. And Father, I pray that you would rebuke a spirit of timidity from off your people. And Lord, may a spirit of boldness come upon us. That Lord, we might be able to bring forth your word to your people, to those, Lord God, that don't know you. That Father, they might know that our God is real. And everybody said amen. 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 Now, even if you're a Christian, I just need to submit the fact that there will be times, times of darkness, times of valley, times in which as the enemy came to Eve and her husband Adam and proposed to them a question, yea, hath God. I just, need to, I just need to let you know that the devil hasn't changed his tactics. That just as he questioned God back then, he's still questioning God today. And, and, and just like he came to Eve back then, he will come to you and he will say, how can God? Why is it that? And he will place question marks in your mind. God, I thought you said. Lord, why is it that? And there's nothing wrong with questioning. God gave you the ability to question and to reason. Nothing wrong with that. There have been questions in my own heart. I've been serving God for over 30 years, and yet sometimes, sometimes I get in that valley. Sometimes I get to that point, and I say, God... Where are you? Listen, it's normal. I wish God would just show up. Physically. Walk through a wall, Jesus. Let me put my fingers in your hands and my hand in your side. Let me see. How many of you would like? No, you wouldn't. It would freak you out. I would have to go visit you in the psych ward. <laughs> so although we pray those things, yet we know that God could just show up, right? Amen. God could show up and there could be this, like, like on CNN. Wouldn't that be cool? Jesus shows up and he walks the streets of Jerusalem. Well, one day it's going to happen. Yeah. Just not yet. Amen. See, right now we walk by faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Why does God place a premium on faith? Not sure, but he sure does. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. Amen. So right now we walk by faith. I'd like God to show up. I'd like for him to, I, I'd like to walk out and there's a big, big face of Jesus in the sky. Right? Yes. Convince everybody. We wouldn't have to, but God doesn't do that because right now we live in the age of grace. And it's by faith that we're saved. Or by grace that we're saved through faith, right? And it's so God places a premium on faith. And may I say to you, you have faith. The fact of the matter that you came to church signifies the fact that you have faith. The fact that you got in your car this morning tells me you have faith. The fact that you got up and went into your bathroom and turned the light switch on signifies to me that you have faith. Because when you turn that light switch on, what did you expect? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. Some say not yet seen. So that's what faith is. That's the working definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, if you already have it, you're not hoping for it. And so faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence, the right now I see it. The evidence of things not yet seen. I don't see it, but I see it. I don't see it, but I know it. I don't see it, but I have it. I know that I have it. I know that I know that it's there. I know that, and that's faith. Are you with me? So faith is a substance of things hoped for. Now, when you went in this morning and you flipped that light switch on, what did you hope for? When you got in that car and you turned that key, what did you hope for? 
Were you disappointed? When you got to church, what did you hope for? That we would be set up and, and, and you not. Dis- when you sat down in that chair, you had faith. You hoped it would hold you up. Thank God it did. Now, it's not blind faith. Because you've turned the light switch on before. And it came on. It's not blind faith because you've turned the key before. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you've come to church before. We were here. You sat down before. It held you up. So it's not blind faith. It's faith based on past experience. So what is David saying? David is saying, look, I'm not asking you to believe in God by blind faith. I'm asking you to look around. I'm asking you to see the things that are all around you because God is screaming out at you day after day after day, and you don't have to believe in God blindly. You just take a look around, and you can believe in God based on something that is already there. So five things. Some say five things. Five things that will help us. Number one, we, we, want, we, want, we want to call it the universe. Some say the universe. That's what David said. David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows forth his handiwork. So it's the universe. What do you mean? I mean the existence of stuff. Let me say it again. For those of you simple folk like me. The existence of stuff. Turn to your neighbor, tell him the existence of stuff. How many of you know stuff happens? And stuff is. Stuff exists. Which, because stuff exists, it creates a huge problem for people who don't believe in God. You say, why is that, Pastor? Well, here's the deal. If something exists then we have to explain it. If it doesn't exist, we don't have to explain anything because it doesn't exist. Are you with me? So if it exists, some say if it exists, we have to explain it. But the minute that something is real, then we have to come up with an explanation for it. See, the universe exists. The moon exists. I know some of you think that that they were in a studio down in New Mexico when they saw Neil Armstrong uh, on the moon. I, I know some of you believe that. I believe there's a real moon. Hello? I believe there's a real sun. I feel it's warmth every day. I believe that things are real. Are you with me? And because it's real, it exists. The universe exists. It's real. We live in it. We see, we hear, we feel, we breathe its air. And the question is this. Where did all the stuff that we see, feel, hear come from? Where did it come from? See, here's the principle. The principle that we all understand intuitively is the nature of cause and effect. Some say cause and effect. Turn to your neighbor, tell them it's cause and effect. What's, what, what, what's that mean? For every effect, there has to be a cause, right? Dave, let me see your wrist. Left one. All right, you didn't work. I'm sorry. I was looking at him. He didn't have one. You don't have, no, you got one. Where did this come from? I mean, I'm looking at that watch this morning. I'm looking at my watch. And, uh, and, and, and I, I'm supposing this morning you didn't just get up and go, whoa! <laughs> Kim! This watch suddenly appeared on my wrist. I'm assuming that didn't happen. I'm assuming this morning you got up, as you have done many times, and you unclasped it and you put it over your hand like I have. You put it on your wrist, and I'm assuming that because of the effect, you're wearing a wristwatch, and I'm wearing a wristwatch, I'm assuming that somebody put it there, and I'm assuming that somebody is you. Am I right? I know, because I put mine on this morning. 
Now also this morning as I look at my wristwatch, it has something written on it. It has the word citizen written on it. Now as I'm looking at my wristwatch, I'm assuming that somebody wrote that word citizen on my wristwatch. How many of you are with me? How many of you would buy into that? Well, can I assume this morning that because we know that this rich wristwatch came from somewhere and the citizen came from somebody putting something on the wristwatch and I put this on my wrist, that everything we see has, all the effects that we see had a cause. The reason we're here is because somebody built this awesome auditorium. The reason that I'm standing on this platform is because somebody built this platform. The reason these question marks are here is because somebody put them there this morning well can I suggest to you that just like all of this stuff was put here by somebody the sun the moon the stars the sky has been shouting at us and saying look this is way too complicated for it just to have happened somebody put this thing here somebody designed this thing Amen. somebody say cause and effect you see, the existence of stuff, the universe, brings us to the second thing, the nature of stuff. Some say the nature of stuff, which is the creator. Some say the creator. Write that down in your notes, the creator. And, and, and may I say, as we're talking about the nature of stuff, more specifically the nature of the universe, because the universe is huge, it's complex. How many of you realize that? It's marvelously well-ordered. And since it exists, you have to explain where it came from. It just didn't happen. Well, I know that one possible explanation of how something got here was that it was self-created. It all came from itself. But that doesn't follow logic. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because scientists who study this sort of thing they tell us that just about everything in the universe is contingent. Now, I know I'm getting a little scientific on you, and I may be boring you this morning, but hang on. You're going to get something out of this. Everything is contingent. Somebody say that with me. Everything is contingent on something else in order to, see, to, to exist. So you've got a great life, but your life is contingent. Your life is contingent upon food to eat. Your life is contingent upon air to breathe. Your life is contingent upon water to drink. If you didn't have any food, you didn't have any water, you didn't have any air, you would be dead within just, you didn't have any air, you'd be dead within just a matter of moments. Are you with me? So everything is contingent. We're contingent upon plants to eat. Can I tell you plants are contingent upon the sun to grow? Can I tell you the sun is contingent upon gravity to stay together? Everything in the universe is contingent and depends upon somebody else, something else for its existence. Are you with me? Yes. Now, so if everything we observe is dependent on something else and not independent or self-caused, the principle of dependency leads us to ask this question. And here it is. If all that exists is dependent, if all that exists is fragile and temporary, then who or what is responsible for all these dependent objects and beings. Can I say that again? Let me say it again. Let me say it slowly so that you can get this. If all that exists is dependent, you and me, the animals, the plants, the sun, everything, if everything that exists is dependent, if its existence is fragile and temporary, then my question to you is, who or what is responsible for all these dependent objects and beings? Oh, philosophers, they've gone through all kinds of mental gymnastics to answer this question with large-sounding words. But let me, let me just, let me dummy it down for all of us. I'll dummy it down to our level. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's talking about you. Where's my hula hoop? I need a hula hoop. Where's my, where's my helpers at? 
I had a hula hoop. Oh, Dante, would you get up? I think I got a hula hoop right on the other side of this thing. And I'm going to hula hoop for these people and show them something like they've never seen before. <laughs> All the way back there, man. I, I think I got a, I mean, it's a, it's a multicolored, take a left, take a left, take a left, right there. Take a left, right there. Come on, come on, come on over here real quick. It's a multicolored, fabulous woman hula hoop. Now, I want a volunteer to come and, no, I'm just teasing. Although we did have some guys doing it earlier, and, 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 this, and, and this was, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine with me this morning. I want you to imagine with me your life, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to zoom out of your life, okay? Everything, everything that you're doing right now. Are you with me, son? Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay. I want you to imagine with me this morning your life. Your life at home. I want, you to, I want you to see your life at home. I want you to see everything that you do inside your house. I want you to see everything you do on a daily basis. Now, I want you to get on Google Earth with me, and I want you to zoom out of that. Okay? So you've gone from your house, you've zoomed out, and now you can see our city. Let's zoom out a little bit further, and let's take a look at our state. How many of you with me? Let's zoom out a little bit further, and let's take a look at our nation. In fact, let's zoom out a little bit further, and let's take a look at our, at our world. Let's zoom out even further, and let's look at our solar system. Let's zoom out further, and let's look at our galaxy. Let's zoom out further, and let's take all the galaxies in the universe, and let's put them all right here. Now that we're there, the question I have for you is this, if everything that is in here is contingent, and if everything in here is eroding, because isn't that the second law of thermodynamics, that everything is deteriorating, yeah. everything's getting worse rather than getting better, right? Well, if everything is in here, and everything is deteriorating according to the second law of thermodynamics, everything is getting worse and falling apart, my question is this, if everything in here was made by something and somebody, then the something and somebody cannot be contingent upon anything or anybody. Because in order to create that, it has to be greater than that. And it's so the creator who created all this thing, all this, is he inside the hula hoop or is he outside? The hula hoop. Well, if he's inside the hula hoop, then it's all going to fall apart. But if he's outside the hula hoop, then we learn a few things from him. We learn that he's a cre creator who is an awesome creator. We take a look at him and we see that he is eternal, that he is existent, that he doesn't depend on anything or anybody for his existence. And so then we understand that this is where God is. And this is who God is. God is not inside our little hula hoop. God is outside and he's looking in and everything he created, he stepped out and he doesn't need it because God is self-sustaining and self-sufficient and he looks in our little hula hula hoop and he's outside some say he's outside your hula hoop now we've already concluded that the stuff inside that circle is dependent it relies on something beside itself for existence so the big question there here, here is this if God is outside and we have concluded that he is if everything inside is fragile and dependent relied on other objects inside the circle how likely is it that the cause of all that we see originated inside or outside the circle? Some say outside. And so by definition, whatever is outside the circle must be independent. Some say independent. Absolutely self-reliant. Some say self-reliant. Which would make this person eternal, unlimited, and all-powerful. That is why David said, take a look at the heavens, take a look at the, at the skies. They proclaim, they shout out, they sing out the glory of God because it's all contingent, but there's a God who is not contingent that made everything and he's not dependent upon anybody. 
Oh, my, 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 my. They're speaking. They're singing. They're shouting. They're talking to us today. Now, God is saying, open your eyes. I'm all around you. And I've left clues to my existence all over the universe. Now, can we take it a step further? Somebody say, go ahead. Now, instead of looking at this big picture right here, let's, uh, let's move on to something else. Let's start with one of these. Everybody knows what this is, right? Uh, give me a moment. How many of you know what this is? Can I ask you, where did this come from? Anybody tell me? Can I explain it to you? Here, let me, let, let, let me explain it to you. I wrote it down for you. Eons ago, an incredible big bang came out of nothing and nowhere. And sent a massive rock spinning into space. As it cooled, a brown, sweet, bubbly liquid formed on the surface. As time passed, aluminum crept out of the water and shaped itself into these exact dimensions. Mm hmm. Which just happened to be the right shape and size for a human hand which would develop a few million years later. But over time, this thing formed itself, a one-time retractable lid. Then a crease started to appear just a bit off center on the top of the lid, and out of it grew a pull tab. Centuries later, red and white paint fell from the sky and clung to this thing, forming the letters C-O-C-A-C-O-L-A. -C -C now, here's my question to you. How many scientific explanations about the nature of matter and the origins of the universe would I have to give to convince you that this can happen by chance? Come on. What are the odds that something this complex and this Amazing. What are, the, what are the odds that this coincidentally happened? By a random collision of molecules. It's too carefully designed. It tastes too amazing. Wouldn't you agree? What are the chances that this just happened? But listen. Listen. This is just a can of Coke. You are a lot more amazingly designed than this can of Coke. That baby that grows inside that mama's womb is a lot more amazing than a can of Coke. This universe is a lot more amazing than a can of Coke. Oh yeah, it perfectly fits in the palm of a, hu of a normal human-sized hand. Its volume is just about right for satisfying one person's desire for something sweet and liquid. It has just enough caffeine to pep you up a bit, but not so much to make you realize that you're in a drug-induced high. Its contents are always the same. Its quality never, veil uh, never varies. What's the conclusion? Some very wise, smart people formed this Coke. This thing did not just happen. Happen. Somebody designed it for the satisfaction of you and my thirst. Can somebody say amen? It didn't just happen. Somebody shout, it didn't just happen. Yeah. Now, let's take a look at the banana. Oh, it was yellow when I brought it this morning. Now, let's look at the banana. Check this out. The far side of the banana has three ridges. The front side has two. Notice how neatly the banana fits into your hand, kind of like it was made for it, right? It has a non-slip surface. 
which cannot be said for the other side of this banana. Now, it comes with a time-sensitive indicator. How many of you know that? Yeah. Green means not yet. Yellow means just right. And brown means too late, buddy. <laughs> it contains a pop-top lid. And the peel fits comfortably over the human hand. It is bent slightly toward the mouth <laughs> for easy entry, right? See, you pull firmly on the tab and you see how those por perforations on the wrapper peel into four pieces and hang gracefully over your hand. This wrapper is environmentally sound, being made completely of biodegradable substances that in time enrich the soil it nestles in. If left uneaten, this, like every other fruit, has pre-programmed orders to reproduce itself into a whole new fruit-bearing plant so that it is virtually an inexhaustible food-producing source. How many of you know this didn't just happen? Are you with me? It's a perfect size and shape for the human mouth. It points towards you for easy entry. It's full of bodybuilding calories. It's easy for the stomach to digest. And the maker of the banana has even curved it towards your face so that you can eat it easier. Now, to design something so intricate and delicate and beautiful and superior as this, whoever created the banana, the banana must be caring. Come on. I said, whoever created the banana must be thoughtful and creative and superior. He must be loving because he designed his creation around the need of his creature. And it is delectable to the taste buds. <laughs> now, here's the third clue to why God is real. Not only because everything exists, and not only thing, because everything is contingent and it needs a creator, but the third thing is your Sense of right and wrong. Some says our sense of right and wrong. Which is our moral standard? Some say our moral standard. And I'm hurrying on. What time do we got? Oh, man, I got, uh, I got 10 more minutes, so hang on with me. Now, here's the deal. Our sense of moral standard. Some say our moral standard. How many of you this morning have ever heard of Trayvon Martin? Come on, let me see. How many of you have heard of Trayvon Martin? How many of you have ever heard of George Zimmerman? Have you looked at that and said, what in the world is going on? I, I think everybody probably has. Can I tell you why everybody is in such an uproar over the Trayvon Martin case? It's because we all know the difference between right and wrong. Come on. We all know that no 17-year-old boy ought to be shot in his housing complex. Do we not? Yes. Amen. Now, we don't know all of, the, all of the circumstances surrounding it, but just at face value, we look at that and we go, look, this is wrong. Love the way you're shouting this morning, but it's true. It's true. We look at, and, and we know that it's better to give life then take life. Except when it comes to the case of deer, Don. And at that point, it's a little, no, I'm just teasing. But somebody say it's better to give life than to take life. It's better to respect somebody's property than it is to steal somebody's property. It's better to leave somebody else's wife alone than it is to try to steal somebody else's. Are, are you with me? We know because we have within us this sense of right and wrong. We were born with it. Are you with me? And anthropologists tell us that this is a universal phenomenon. Morals might vary from person to person, culture to culture, but every person has morals. Now, here's the interesting thing. I need to ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever done what you knew to, to believe 
and what you knew was, was wrong? Let me see your hands. How many of you have ever betrayed your morals? Let me see your hands. Now, anthropologists also tell us that this is a universal phenomenon. That all people, some say all people. Listen to this. All people admit that they have within them a moral standard and that they haven't lived up to their moral standard because their moral standard is actually higher than they are. Now, here's the question. How do you explain that? If it was left over me, over to me, I'd say, our moral standard's here. The Bible says he has set eternity in the hearts of men. See, the Bible tells us, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. Six days shall you labor and do your work. Honor your father and mother. Go on. You shall not murder. Some say you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, quit stealing. You shall not lie. Some say you shall not lie. And you shall not covet your neighbor's trailer house. I'm just teasing you. We don't have those here, do we? But anyway, here we, <laughs> here we are. You see, we look at this, and the, the, this, is, this is the fact that we all have a moral standard. Now, can, can, I, can I just, let, let me put these things together. Let me, let me just, just bring it together. The circle of contingency leads us to conclude that the universe was created by an uncreated creator. Are you with me? With an unlimited, eternal, all-powerful being. The banana shows us that this creator is very smart, creative, thoughtful, and cares about his creation. Do you follow? He put great beauty and care into his creation, so he must be smart, beautiful, creative, and caring. Now, our own hearts demonstrate to us that the creator surpasses us in morals, or he wouldn't have been, or he wouldn't have been able to create morals that were higher than we are. So what do you do? You put all of those things together, and here's what you have. You have an eternal, powerful, smart, beautiful, loving, moral creator. And that comes to a working definition of God. Amen. Let me say it again. We have an eternal, powerful, smart, beautiful, loving, moral creator. We have an eternal, powerful, smart, beautiful, loving, moral creator. Hallelujah. That is a working definition of God if I've ever heard it. Now, if that's not enough for you, five things that show us God is real. What's the first thing? Our universe. Some say our universe. What's the second thing? Our creator. The third thing, our moral standard. Here's the fourth thing. Somebody shout it. Jesus. 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 See, one of the greatest examples of, the existence of, of the, the existence of God is the life of Jesus. You say, how do you get that? Well, here's the deal. Jesus came and Jesus said, I am God. Jesus said, I'm God. <laughs> Look, nobody else ever claimed to do that. Nobody else ever claimed. Oh, there's some kooks. I mean, uh, there, there are some. But you take a look at the people that, for, uh, that, that formulated major religions. You take, a look at, you take a look at Confucius. You take a look at Buddha. You know, millions of people follow Buddha, millions of people follow Confucius, and yet neither Buddha nor Confucius claimed to be God. They were silent on the subject. Didn't claim to be God. Then there were a couple of other people, a guy by the name of Muhammad, a guy by the name of Joseph Smith. These guys, they didn't claim to be God. They claimed to be prophets, but they didn't claim to be God. Are you with me? Only Jesus stood up and he said, look, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Only Jesus claimed, hey, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Only Jesus claimed to be eternal. Now, Jesus claimed to be God. Either he was who he said he was, which would be God, or he was delusional, which would mean he's a lunatic, or he is just a con man, right? Right? So either he was a liar, a lunatic, or he was who he said he was, and he was Lord. So, there we have the dilemma. Well, this morning, obviously Jesus claimed to be God, 
People struggle with that. But if that's not true, then he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. On Good Friday, he was flogged with 39 lashes. By the time it was over, his flesh was cut to ribbons and his organs exposed. He was nailed to a cross, and a professional Roman executioner pronounced him dead. His death was verified by him piercing the tissue around Jesus' heart with a spear. According to the Jewish custom, Jesus' body was laid on a stone table in a burial chamber. He was then packed in a hundred pounds of spices. His body was then wrapped in three separate burial garments, and a stone weighing nearly two tons was placed over the door of the tomb. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, ordered a special guard unit to make the tomb as secure as they knew how. Each soldier was trained to defend 12 square feet of ground. Then they sealed the tomb with a clay signet seal of Rome. And if it were broken, it was punishable by their death. From eyewitness accounts, Jesus' disciples were discouraged, they were scared, and they were in shock. And when reports of Jesus' resurrection came in, they refused to believe he was even alive. Now, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, the disciples would have known it. But of the original 12 disciples, Judas committed suicide, and the other 11 all died a martyr's death. If, if, if it was a lie, they would have never given their lives for a lie. It would have been highly unlikely. Some say highly unlikely. Now, five people examined the tomb and found it empty that first Easter morning. The stone, that two-ton stone had been rolled uphill. My question is, how did that happen? And over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. Those eyewitnesses were from various stations of life in various states of disbelief, yet they all devoted the rest of their lives to sharing the story that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he died on a cross and rose from the dead. They all devoted the rest of their lives to sharing the fact that Jesus Christ was still alive. How do you explain that? I can't, other than the fact that Jesus Jesus died, he was buried, he rose from the dead, proving that he was who he said he was. He was Lord. He was not a lunatic. He was not a liar, but he was who he said he was. His life proves the fact that there is a God. And finally, our experience, let me say our experience, our experience, Jesus Christ has changed countless of lives, countless numbers of lives throughout the years. And there's no way that some people in this room would be changed if Jesus were not God. If we would have called upon Buddha, we wouldn't have been changed. If we would have called upon Confucius, we wouldn't have been changed. If we would have called upon Joseph Smith, we wouldn't have been changed. If I called upon Joseph Smith that day, I'd be still swimming in my drugs and I'd be still wallowing in my alcohol and I'd still be unchanged because Joseph doesn't have the way to change my heart. Mohammed can't change my heart. Only Jesus, who's the Son of God, had come in and he changed my life. When I was a baby, my mother gave me away. My mother had me. A month later, she went to my aunt. She said, here, he's yours. My aunt took me away from my mother, took me to another city. When I was five years old, my mother gave me a Christmas gift. Not my auntie, but my mother. Gave me a Christmas gift. I didn't even know how to read properly. And I remember that morning, that Christmas morning, looking under the Christmas tree. And as I looked under the Christmas tree, there it was. The BB gun I had always dreamed of. It was a daisy lever action. And I took that BB gun and one of my, well, it was my, my, my brother's girlfriend, read the little card attached to this most amazing gift. And it said, Merry Christmas. 
with love, your mom, Ruth. And then she explained the fact that years ago I had been taken from my mother, grown up without even the knowledge. And yet here was a note that said, I love you. Merry Christmas. We were all taken away from our father. He didn't give us away, but we were taken away. Some by circumstances, some by your own selfish will, but we were all taken away. And because God couldn't live without us, he came and he gave us a gift. And attached on the gift was a note called the Bible. And he let us know that whenever we were ready, the door was still open and we can come home anytime we want. And it was about Seven, eight years later, when I came to the conclusion that that was my family, and that was my mom. And I remember the day that I left where I was living, and I came back home, and they opened the doors, and I came back under her roof. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this. God wants you under his roof. And it doesn't matter what's taken you away. God sent his son with a message that whenever you're ready, he'll welcome you under his roof again. Amen? Amen. 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 God says in order to come under his roof, you only have to do two things. Somebody say believe and receive. Believe. believe that God exists. Believe that he is. That's what we're talking about today. God is real. Some say God is real. So you got to believe, first of all, that he is, and not only that, but that he forgives you, he loves you, and he paid the price for you to come home. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and we're done. Have you gotten something out of today? Hopefully, you've gotten something out of today. Let me ask you a couple of questions, and we're done. Number one, all right? Here's the first question. How many of you can raise your hand? I just, I just want to see. How many of you can raise your hand? Okay, I, I just want to know that. Okay, that's the first question. Very simple. Okay, but here, here we go. Here we go. A couple of questions. Number one. How many of you would say that the evidence I presented this morning makes sense? That God probably does exist based on the existence of the universe? Let me see your hands. Okay, good. If you didn't, I probably wouldn't have done my job. Secondly, how many of you would be willing to admit that if God does exist and, we, and we've concluded that he does, then he probably knows more than you do? Turn to your neighbor, tell him, I'm not God, and neither are you. Final question. If we've concluded that according to the testimony of the universe, God exists, and that God probably knows more than we do, then the final question is this. If God does exist, and if God knows more than you do, which we have concluded that he is and that he does, then how many of you would be willing to admit that not only does God exist and knows more than you do, but you would undoubted, that he would undoubtedly be better at directing your life than you are. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, that's for sure. Now, so if God exists, which we've concluded that he does, that he knows more than we do, because he exists and he knows more than we do, that he would probably be better at running our lives than we are. Then why isn't he running your life? Why aren't you letting him call the shots? 
If he's bigger than you are, he created everything. He knows you better than you do. And he can run your life better than you can. Then why are you still trying to run your own life? Why are you still trying to do your own thing? Why are you still trying to make it happen? Why don't you today just come to God and say, God, the heavens declare your glory and I know you exist. And because I know you exist, I know you're smarter than I am. And because I know you're smarter than I am, you can run my life better than I can. God, I'm tired. I give you my life. I'm tired of messing up. I'm tired of running off the road. I'm tired of being sick and tired. God, I'm tired. Take over. You see, today, most of us won't let him take over because, because we, we, we're control freaks. Don't turn to the person next to you and look at him. But you know who you are. You're control. You want to be in control. And you fear that if you allow God to take over your life, he's going to make you do something you don't want to do. That's not true. God loves you. And he only wants the best for you. You fear. And God, listen, you have nothing to fear. Maybe it's your pride. Maybe you can't admit that you can't handle it. Look, 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 look. You can't handle it. None of us can handle it. We've all messed up. We all need God. So, here's the deal, and I'm done. The pivotal issue is not, is God real? That's not the issue. The issue is this. Can you trust him? Can you trust him with your life? Because if you can... It makes all the sense in the world to invite him into your life to direct you and to change you today. Amen? Amen. Why not trust him? Why not trust him? Stand with me. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I've done my best. I've done my best. Jesus, take over. Take over. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Please, nobody looking around this morning. God, I pray that you would help people in this place. People who have been afraid to trust you. They know you're real. They can feel your presence. That's why they come to church at Life Church. Because they feel the presence of God in this place. And Father God, I pray today in Jesus' name that you would so reach down and touch somebody's life that Lord, you would help them to realize that not only are you real, but they can trust you. God, if you made a banana just for them, it shows that you care for them that you love them and that you want want only good things for them. And Father God, I pray that today people would put their pride on the seat. They would put their fear of being out of control on the shelf. And they would come before you today just like so many have already come in this room and just say, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of trying to do it my own way. I'm I'm tired of trying to make things work on my own. God, I'm tired. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you love me. And I believe you have my best interest at heart. Their heads are bowed and their eyes are closed. I want to ask you this morning, is there anybody in this place, anybody in this place, balcony or main floor, who would say, Pastor Doby? It makes sense. Pastor Dolby, I understand it now. Perhaps like I've never understood it before. I need Jesus. I need him in my life. And I wanna I wanna give him control. I wanna give him control. Anybody in this place this morning, if that's you, do me a favor, lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I want to give him control of my life right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in the back. 
Anybody else? Come on, lift it up high. Let me see it this morning. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you back there, honey. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Anybody in the balcony this morning? I want to give Jesus control of my life. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you up there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. So many people in this room this morning. God bless you, honey. Because look, as you raise your hand, you're not just saying, Lord, I want to give you control of my life. I want to give you control of my baby's life as well. And today as you come and we pray, God's not just going to change your life. He's going to change your baby as well. Because when God changes mamas, God changes the future of babies and children as well. And what you feel in your heart right now, that's not, that's not me. That's God. That's God. God's letting you know right now, because he's real, he's letting you know right now that he has a beautiful future for you. And all of the old junk and all the mistakes and all the stuff, God today is going to wash that away in his blood and he's going to give you wisdom. He's going to take you by the hand today and he's going to change your life.